Hey you folks, Quillyteen here, and welcome to my tutorial for C Sharp for Complete Beginners. This is one of the most requested things on my channel, and my Patreon backers have been very awesome to support the idea of a pure tutorial, a pure C Sharp introduction tutorial that is not going to be in Unity. We are going to be operating inside of Mono Develop or Xamarin Studio over here because we're going to focus purely on the C Sharp itself. Because the thing with programming, is very much like learning another language. One part of learning another language is learning the syntax and grammar rules. Another part of learning a real world language is learning the vocabulary. You know, it's all good and well to know that you're supposed to construct a sentence by going um, subject, verb, object, for example. But, you know, if your sentence ends up being fire truck dances apple, Okay, that technically follows the syntax rules, but doesn't make any sense. Um, and maybe it's because you don't know any of the words. You don't know what the vocabulary is. So when you program in something like Unity, which you can program in, in JavaScript or Unity, or sorry, you can program in JavaScript or C Sharp, or potentially Boo as well, within Unity itself, you're using the JavaScript or C Sharp syntax, but interacting with the Unity vocabulary. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make an extremely simple program that is going to use almost no actual vocabulary whatsoever, so we can focus purely on the C Sharp. So first step will be to install MonoDevelop. You can, if you're on Windows, you can do this in Visual Studio as well, but MonoDevelop, the advantage of it is it is, is, it is available on uh, all kinds of platforms, uh, Windows, Mac, Linux. Also, this is the editor that comes um, by default with Unity, so a lot of people are familiar to work with it. This is slightly different. Again, it's the MonoDevelop website, but technically what you're downloading in is Marin Studio, which has a commercial component if you want, but you can use it for free for exactly what we're doing over here. So you can just go ahead and grab that, and that is groovy. And then when you install it and run it, you're going to get something that looks very much like this. Now, Unfortunately, to start off, we're sort of a little bit going to have to do, you're going to have to accept that there's a little bit of magic going on. Some things that aren't really going to be explained, um, but that will just work because of reasons, and then we'll come back and explain why those things are later on. So, uh, if you are at this screen here, if you're not, if you happen to have a project open for some reason, just make sure to go to File, Close All Solutions, but otherwise, you are going to go to New Solution. Solution is the name for, like, a project in... I don't know. I don't know why IDE started calling things solutions. I, I don't know what the good reason for that is. But anyway, we're going to choose a template for our, our project over here. And, um, oh, by the way, the first time you run Zamarin, it will ask you to do some updates. You'll have to download all those. And anyway, then you'll get to this point here. So there's a few different options. And what we're particularly interested in is we're un interested in other. We're making a pure .NET project. So... .NET is effectively, for lack of a better, you know, explanation, .NET is effectively the, the library that we're going to be working with, right? We're talking about vocabulary. Well, the vocabulary belongs in dictionaries that belong in libraries. Well, your .NET is basically your library that you're going to use with C Sharp. They're, they're kind of linked. I think that's probably the best and simplest explanation I can come up with. Anyway, we're going to choose console project over here and C Sharp. Make sure that's all set up. So what's a console? A console is a really old school um, DOS-based, terminal-based kind of window. It, this will work perfectly fine whether you're running on Windows, Linux, or the Mac, for example. So um, you need to pick a project name. So I'm going to call this, um, I don't know, C Sharp Tutorial, like this. And it's got to pick a location. This is where it's defaulting for me and my user directory. That's fine. You can you can stick anywhere as your as your location. I'm going to go ahead and use that. That's going to be fine. And I'm going to go ahead and hit create. So this will create in a moment. There we go. This will create uh, a not quite empty project for us. I'm going to go and embiggen this so that you guys can see it properly on the screen. Wonderful. A not quite empty project for us is has been created. And if I actually go, hang on, I'm just going to do this on my other H users, Martin documents, what was it? Projects? Projects, C Sharp tutorial, there we go. And let me bring it over to this screen. Here we go. So this folder over here, this is where our project is sitting. And um, Mono Develop here has created a few things for us. It created a couple of .sln file here. That is the actual... Um, configuration for the project. It's got this user prefs. Okay. It's got another folder in here, which has got the same name. So it's C sharp tutorial and then another C sharp tutorial. It's got a bunch of things going on that it created for us. But the big important thing, the only thing that really does anything right now is this program dot 
CS. .CS stands for C Sharp. This is just a text file. It's worth noting, you can edit this in absolutely any text editor you would like. So for example, if I open this in Sublime Text over here, that is perfectly fine. We get exactly the same text that we have in the window here. What is Mono Develop? What is Visual Studio? These things are, well, a combination of things, but as, as a whole, they're referred to as IDEs. They're integrated development environments. What they are, are text editors that are optimized for editing code so that it, it makes, it stylizes things, it color codes things for you, which is very handy. Although you'll notice that Sublime Text is smart enough to do some coloring here for you as well. It also keeps track of this sort of project over here. It can give you a breakdown, the file that you're looking at here, it can actually break down into functions and classes and fields. We'll talk about those things later on. It's a very handy dandy environment, but it also is very tightly linked with the actual compilers for your program. So at some point, this text becomes code. And that happens when it gets run through a compiler and a linker and a few other various steps. But you know, effectively, when you build it, when you build this project, so build, build all, this will build the actual executable file. Um, in, in terms for C sharp, you actually always end up with a .exe, even if you are on the Mac or Linux. It's just the way that on Mac or Linux you run it is you, uh, you have mono installed. It will install by default when you install Zamarian, or you can install it standalone if you want. And from the, uh, the, the console, you can literally just type mono space and then you know, your program.exe and it will execute it. But so in any case, you end up with the same executable, which literally I think is literally the same executable no matter what platform you're on. But I'm, I may be lying to you about that. Um, the actual runtime implementation of C Sharp and .NET is not uh, something that I'm 100% on. So your mileage may vary. In any case, the IDE bundles that in so that you can easily build it there rather than use command line tools to do it. It can run. It's often integrated with a debugger as well. I don't think we're going to be dealing with the debugger here uh, for a few different reasons, but one of which is that um, debugging here is a little bit different from debugging in Unity, and so we'll probably just ignore that. Anyway, now that we've built it, technically, if I go back to my folder over here, and I go into bin binary files, and I check debug because we're currently on the debug setting, I have an executable there. And if I double click on this, I will run it. But you see, I, I don't even know if you can tell here in the YouTube video, it opens for a split second and then closes. Why is that? Well, because it runs and all it's doing when it's running is it's printing hello world to the console and then the program ends. So the window instantly closes. Now you can on windows um, configure uh, a configure these executables to stay open and if you're on Mac or Linux by default the terminal will probably stay open by itself which is quite handy to save yourself a little bit of trouble you can also run the program from inside of mono develop here either with or without the debugger for your purposes it will literally make no difference which way you start it uh, so let's say we start it with without the debugger and what will happen here in Windows is it will actually leave it open for me after the program runs which simply outputs hello world we're going to look at these lines in a moment. Um, after it runs, the program ends, and then the the console environment itself is set up so that when it ends, it prompts you with this press any key to continue. This press any key to continue is not part of your program, but it just means the window stays open instead of closing instantly, which is handy. Also, if you, like me, are concerned, uh, by the way, note the hotkeys F5 or Control F5 on Windows can run your program. On the Mac, I think it's Command R just like building is command B, I believe on the Mac, as opposed to F8 on Windows. Um, if you're here, you should be able to go here, properties, this is in Windows, and increase the font size, which I'm gonna do so that you guys can see it a little bit more clearly on the UbTubs over there. So there we go, okay. So we've got some sort of dummy program built for us, and we know how to run it. So what does any of this stuff mean? Well, again, we're sorta of gonna have to accept that there's a little bit of magic here, um, but we're gonna come back to using, we're gonna ignore that for now, Namespace is actually also relatively ignorable for now. A namespace, in a sense, for what you need to worry about now, it doesn't really do anything other than group your code into a particular category. And it, the reason that's important is because later on, we're gonna learn about classes, what classes are and how to work with them. And you can name classes whatever you want. You might have a class called, say, character for your character in your game, right? Or player, here's a good, better example. Let's say we make a class called player to hold information about your player in the game. You don't maybe not know what that means yet, but it sounds pretty reasonable, right? Well, here's the problem. Let's say you do that and it's great. Later on, you want to add music to your game. 
and you uh, you bring in this other library that someone has created that includes uh, the ability to play music. But they have a class in there called player. They think of it as a music player. So you have a class called player and they have a class called player. How does that not conflict? Well, it doesn't conflict because ideally each one of those classes would be bundled within a greater namespace. And that's really the main purpose of namespace is a space where these names are unique. You can't have two player, two classes named player within the same namespace because they would conflict, but as long as they're in separate namespaces, it's okay. All right, namespace, class, we're, we're gonna talk about classes a lot more later on. But then we have a specific thing here. This is a function and this is a particularly magic function. Up, if your program has a public static function named main, that is what gets executed when your program runs. You may not know what a function is yet, you may not know what a lot of these words mean yet, but what it means is whatever's inside this function, which is this bit over here, that's what runs when your program runs. That's why it says hello world. Now, this is a function that belongs to a particular library of code, a particular class, and we're gonna look at that a little bit more later, but quite clearly, writes a line to the console. It's like, okay, yeah, all right. It's written the other way around from how you would say it in English, right? You, you say you write a line to the console. Here we've got console.write line. But all right, you can, you can sort of parse that. That's good. And then hello world in quotes. You're like, all right, that's probably what it says. And in fact, that's entirely true. If we, if we run the program, it says hello world. Good. So let's talk about what this line, um, let's break this line apart a little bit more. Specifically, we're gonna start with this section over here, hello world in quotes. This is referred to as a string. A string is a series of characters bundled together. You're gonna to work with strings a lot. Any text you wanna output or input is gonna be stored within strings. And a string is stored in your computer's memory somewhere. So what happens when the program runs, it's got these letters in this sequence stored in your program's memory and right line points to that spot of the memory and returns it. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's, let's do a little bit of an example. We're gonna introduce the concept of a variable. Now, if you remember, you know, math from, I don't know, when you start learning about variables, you know, solve for X kind of thing, it's probably in grade school now. I don't know, it's gotta be before high school anyway. Anyway, so you may remember uh, variables from that point of view, right? Actually, before we talk about variables, I'm gonna talk about comments. If you put two slashes in a C or C++ or C sharp program, that's a comment and the computer ignores anything over here. You can type whatever you want over here and it's fine. If I try to build this program, build successful. If I didn't have this and I tried to build this program, 10 errors, one line. 10 errors, oh my God, everything goes bonkers because the compiler doesn't know what to do with this. This is just garbage. Well, I mean, it literally is garbage, but it really has no idea what to do with it. So if you put the two slashes there and we rebuild, no errors whatsoever. Anyway, so in your old schooling where you'd have something like five is equal to say X plus two, and you'd have to sort of rewrite things to, to end up with something that looked more like X is equal to, um, I guess it was two minus five is what you would end up with. Um, you know, you got used to the idea that X has a value. You just don't know what it is. You have to solve for X. In computer programming, variables are more like desk drawers or mailboxes, okay? You can, they, they are a placeholder for data and you can stuff data into this. So this, rather than saying like X is equal to something, you just don't know what it is yet. This equal sign is actually called the assignment operator. This takes whatever is on the right side. So in this case, it would be minus three, right? Two minus five is minus three. This takes minus three and stuffs it inside of X, puts it in that drawer. And because programs are sequential, you can then change it. You can then on the very next line say X equals two. And what happens then, you open the drawer, you take the minus three, throw it out and then stuff a two in there. This is perfectly fine. If you ever saw this, in a math equation, you'd be like, this doesn't make any sense because it's all part of one sort of equation. X can only have this one value, but here we can change it. We just stuff d new values into that desk drawer and replace them. And we can do things with it. And that's very important because this is how computers remember certain things. Really, this is pointing to some location out in RAM and referencing to it back and forth. So let's see this in effect. We're gonna define a new string. Our hello world here, we can change it. We can say, 
you know, I could say something like, hello YouTube. And if we run this, then it'll say, why is it closing right away? Hmm, that was odd. I don't know why that was happening. Anyway, um, hello YouTube. See, so we can change that string. That's pretty straightforward. But we're going to put this inside of a variable. So what I would like to do is I would like to say x is equal to, and then let's let's define a string over here. Why is there a semicolon over here? We'll talk about that in a second. And so I want to put my hello YouTube over here. And then I want to write out x like that. That that mostly works. You can see there's a red under, un, underline already. There's something weird going on if we try to build it right now. So I'm just going to use F8 here to build it. The name X does not exist in the current context. You have to tell the computer ahead of time that you have a variable called X. You have to declare the variable called X. And the reason especially that you have to declare it in C Sharp before you use it is because in C Sharp, variables are strongly typed. What does that mean? Well, that means we have to tell C Sharp what this variable is going to hold. Some languages are dynamically typed for their variables. You can hold a number in a variable, and the next moment you can put a string in there, the next moment you can put some sort of arbitrary object in there, and so on and so forth. In C Sharp, you can't do that. You have to explicitly define what kind of data a variable holds. And I, more or less, there's there's sort of ways around it, but just assume I'm telling you the truth right now. Um, we can talk about maybe like the base object type or what a var declaration does later on. But it is actually much better for all kinds of reasons if we just assume that it is 100% strongly typed in C Sharp. And many languages are like that. And the advantage to having a strongly typed language is that it actually runs much faster. And this is the big one. It allows the compiler to catch errors for you. If X is always supposed to hold this string, and all of a sudden, instead of having a string, you have some other type of value in there. We'll talk about what that means later on. The compiler can tell you that you're trying to stuff the wrong kind of data into the wrong kind of variable, which is good. Anytime the compiler can catch an error for you, you save a lot of time. So what we're going to do now is we're going to define the variable X. We're going to define it as there's a string X, and again, I will end this in a semicolon. Every instruction, every command in C Sharp ends with a semicolon. And here's an interesting thing. White space doesn't matter in here. Spaces, enters, tabs, none of those things matter. In fact, we, if we wanted to, could take this whole program and write it on one line like this. As far as the computer can tell, there's no difference. The computer, when you start compiling it, it strips away all white space. I mean, you need one in between so that, you know, this string X doesn't work. You need, a, you need at least one gap between string and X, but you can have lots. This is exactly the same. And if we were to run this, it would be fine. However, just for making things a little bit more legible, we're going to do this. So we're declaring a string called X. We're telling the compiler there's a variable called X and it's supposed to hold strings. And then here we are assigning this string to the variable X. And then we're telling console.writeline, which we still don't know about, much about, to write X. So if we go and run this, we get our hello YouTube. And what's cool about this is we can use it more than once, right? Like I can say, let's output it three times. Hello YouTube, hello YouTube, hello YouTube. That's great. Let's, over here, we're going to say, how are you? So what I'm doing is I'm changing the value of X. So what's going to happen when I run this? Hello, YouTube. How are you? How are you? So we are changing the value of x. Variables, very important. All right. So that's that's a great little example. Not particularly cool, but we're outputting some stuff. We're learning about variables. Excellent. Let's go and bring it up one more notch and talk about input. So I said the reason we're doing this in C Sharp is because in pure C Sharp, as opposed to inside of Unity, is because I'm trying to strip away as much of the library, as much of the vocabulary as possible, and just teach you the basics of the language itself. There is, however, a little bit more sort of library vocabulary that we're going to have to learn. We are using console.writeline to output information to the user. This is part, see this using system? What we're doing here is we're importing a whole library of classes and functions, including console. Technically, console is system.console. We could ignore using system over here. If we do that, you'll see we get an error because console doesn't exist. Computer doesn't know what console is. But we could actually say it's system.console. 
Inside the main system library, there's another library called console, which has this function called write line. Technically, console is a class within the system namespace, but think of it, you can think of it as libraries and books and so on and so forth. At least for now, that's fine. So that's okay. That gets rid of that error. And I mean, I could do the same thing over here. And then we would be back to running perfectly fine. With using, you can just pull in that whole namespace. And then you don't have to put in that extra little system bit. This still runs, but actually, Zamarian is nice enough to say, hey, this can be simplified. That's why it's in gray like this. We can simplify it by doing this. So we are going to use the console library for quite a few little things over here. One, we're using it to write lines, but we can also use it to read a line of text from the console. Let's try that. Instead, so we're going to say, hello, YouTube, or um, hello. And then we're going to say, what is your name? What is your name? So we're going to write that out. And then what we want to do is we want to find out what the user's name is. And we can do that with console.readline. Now, first things first, I get emails almost every single day from people saying, I followed your tutorial and I did exactly what you did, but it doesn't work for me. Well, you know, my response is always, well, if you literally did exactly what I did, it would work for you. So if it doesn't work for you, you must not have done something exactly right. And that includes things like capitalization. See how we get an underline here? The computer has no idea what lowercase c console is. It only knows uppercase c console. As far as the computer is concerned, these are two completely different things with no connection to each other whatsoever. This is actually a good thing for lots of reasons, but it is an important part of how computers work. They don't recognize the context of symbols and their meaning and their implications. All it knows is that this symbol is different from this symbol. So how could they possibly be the same? This period is important. You can't have a comma here. It's got to be a period. There's, there's a reason for it. And we'll get into more of this later on. The semicolon has to be there. So if you try to use a capital X for a variable, things stop working. So we need to make sure you spell things 100% exactly correct, which we have here. So console.writeline. Writeline is a function that belongs to the console class. It's technically a static function. Again, we'll talk about what that means later on. Um, even though we've got these, these keywords over here, we're just ignoring them. They're magic words for now. So they've got a function called writeline where you pass it a string and it writes it out. So readline over here is a function that doesn't take a parameter. You don't have to pass it anything. Instead, this function returns something. Now, at this point, it would actually potentially be a great idea for you to literally open up a window, go to Google, and type in console.readline space C sharp, and then hit enter. What you'll do is you'll find the MSDN page from Microsoft, the Microsoft Developers Network entry for this entire library, the console library in C sharp, that defines every single function that's in there. Now, Zamarian, mono develop here, and most IDEs auto-complete things. So this is, oops, this, as soon as you put the period in here, is a list of every function and property that you can access from the console, which is great. You can also find the documentation online. Also, if you do mouse over one of these, the tooltip will give you some amount of information. But again, if you go online, you can find more detailed information and examples. But if we look here, you can see that readline is a public static, we don't know what those words are yet, string readline. That string there, where it says string, that's the return value. Readline returns a string. If we compare to write line, well, first of all, you can see that write line expects a, a parameter. It expects a parameter that's a string that it refers to as a value. We're passing x, but it's, it doesn't matter what our variable is called, but it expects us to pass it a string in the parentheses. And you can see it returns void. Void means nothingness. Write line literally returns absolutely nothing to us. We cannot check to see write line doesn't give us anything back, but read line does. Now, what's interesting is we can ignore this, right? If we run this now, oops, I want the, this one. Hello, what is your name? And you can see it's waiting for input. Uh, my name is Quill. I'm gonna hit enter. And then the program ends. But read line allows the user to type any number of characters and followed by enter, and then it returns that string. So a string is being returned from here, but we don't, we don't keep that. We're not doing anything with it. 
what do we do with it? Well, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to define a new string called name, and we're going to assign it that. Now, see what's happening here. We are defining this string. We're defining a new variable called name that holds a string, and we are assigning it at once. So here, we, define, we declared it and then assigned it, but you can do it all at the same time, and you can do a complicated one. So here, not only are we declaring it and assigning it, we're assigning it from the return value of console.readline over here. So we're making it all in one line. Kind of a complicated line, a lot of things going on, but this works. So now we've got the name, so what are we going to do with it? Well, let's, let's split, the, split this out. We're going to say, um, we're going to set x, and we don't need x. x. I was doing this as an example. We could, of course, be feeding things directly into right line, but that's okay. We're going to say, uh, with x, uh, we're going to say, it's nice to meet you, comma, space, and then what I'd like to do is have the name show up after that. Well, one of the things you can do with strings in C Sharp is you can add them together. This with the string is a concatenate operation. It's adding this string to this string by just appending one to the other, right? And it's very important that how this appending word. So let's see what this looks like, right? If we, if we output this, let's run this again. My name is Quill. It's nice to meet you, Quill. And then the program ends. Excellent. Now, it's important to note that this is concatenation because let's say we do this. Let's say we set x to be equal to 1 plus 8, like this. This is a string containing the character 1 followed by another string containing the character 8. 1 plus 8, right line. What do you suppose this is going to print? Well, I mean, if you've followed the logic of how strings work, and the plus operator, you should have guessed this prints 18. This prints 1-8. And it's very important why that is, why that's printing 1-8, because these are strings. As far as the computer is concerned, the string with a character 1 and another string with a character 8 have nothing to do with the numbers 1 and 8. And a plus operation with two strings simply concatenates the strings. X is now this because a string variable is very different from an integer variable. So we're going to make an integer called y and it's going to hold 1 plus 8. Notice there are no double quotes here because what we're doing is these are numbers. These are in fact integers. Integers are whole numbers. This is something that exists in math. But it's very important that from a computer point of view, a variable that contains just a whole number type, an integer type, is very different from something that holds decimals. This cannot, the, the integer y cannot hold decimal values. So now we have this, and we can output this. So we're going to do another console dot right line, and we're going to have it output y. So right line is actually flexible enough that it doesn't just take a string. In fact, you see how it says 2 of 19 here? If I hit the down arrow key on my computer, I can go through all these different variants of right line. And again, if you look up the documentation for console.writeline online, you can see all these different variants and how they work. So console.writeline accepts a string, which is this, but is also perfectly happy to accept an integer and print that out. A lot of functions don't have these, um, these overloads is how they're referred to. So, you know, Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, right line is very flexible, so we'll accept this. So let's run this one more time. What is your name? My name is Quill. It's nice to meet you, Quill. Then we print out 1-8, right? This is not 18. This is the character 1 followed by character 8 concatenated together into a single string. But then this bit here, this is the number 1 plus 8, which returns 9, and stuffs that inside of Y. So Y holds the number 9. Not a string or a character 9, it holds a number 9. And then it outputs that. So there you go. So there's a basic introduction to a wee bit of, it's not really program flow, except the fact that it's sequential, and variables. There we go. Next episode, we are going to introduce a lot more sort of flow logic to our little set up here, we're going to start working our way towards a game, and we're going to use what we've learned here to do that. Hope this tutorial is working okay. Don't hesitate to ask some questions down below in the comments. You can also email me, uh, quillyteen at quillyteen.com, or tweet at me, at 
Quill18, and do make sure to follow over there as well. And uh, appreciate you watching and sharing and favoriting, doing all that kind of jazz. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you everyone who continues to make Project Porcupine a reality by supporting us on Patreon. You guys are supporting us through August and early September and including these mic check supporters, we've got Drazion, Jan Tori Vell, Julian Auger Lafon, Craig Mortel, Neil Blakey Milner, Ole Peter Talgo, Wes Oldenboving, Kale the Quick, Valiant Cake Fiend, Aaron Toivison, Michael McClintock, Marius Field Vold, Speedy Savant, Jason Yanity, Adjective, Steven Steger, Kupro Panda, Yuko Finn, and absolutely everyone who's watched, shared, favorited, and subscribed these videos. I appreciate you very, very much.